computer. Okay. Hi, everybody. It's a great personal pleasure to have Earl Miller with us from MIT today. Um, Earl is the, the Picower Professor of Neuroscience at the Picower Institute for Learning and Memory at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology at MIT. He received his BA in psychology from Kent State University, a university which he, I know him personally, and he keeps giving back to this place. And it's really great to see the reciprocal, reciprocal connection with his alma mater. Uh, he did his PhD in psychology and neuroscience in 1990 from Princeton University. In Princeton University, he did do. I'm not sure it's mentioned here, but he did do his PhD, his postdoc with uh, Bob Desimon at NIH. Um, a work that when it came out really influenced my own work on, on priming and other aspects of uh, repetition and learning. So this, often when people ask me about revolutions in neuroscience, I used to talk about this repetition suppression that in retrospect now seems so intuitive, but back then it was revolutionary in my mind. Uh, currently, uh, Professor Miller studies the neural basis of executive control, the ability to carry out goal-directed behavior using complex mental processes and cognitive abilities. This includes working memory, attention, decision-making, and learning. His lab has made numerous discoveries about the neural circuits, uh, networks, and mechanisms by which the brain's prefrontal cortex wields executive control. They've shown how categories and concepts are learned, how multifunctional mixed selectivity neurons endow the cortex with computational versatility and flexibility, and how neural oscillations regulate neural communications and consciousness. Um, Speaking of which, you can find Earl's uh, voice and ideas in many uh, public uh, media conversations about the, the myth of multitasking, if I uh, may add this as well. Uh, his work has helped in establishing foundation for, uh, upon which to construct more detailed mechanistic accounts of cognition and its dysfunction and, dis in, in the, its dysfunction and diseases such as autism, schizophrenia, and attention deficit disorder. Professor Miller is the recipient of, vari of a variety of awards and serves as the editor and the on editorial boards of major journals in neuroscience and an international advisory board. His paper with Jonathan Cohen from uh, Princeton, which presented a new framework for understanding the prefrontal cortex, ranks fifth all time in citations in neuroscience. And it's even tattooed recently on his uh, right arm, is it? Yes, yeah. <laughs> so it's a great, great pleasure to have Earl. Earl is a, is a personal friend, dear friend of mine, and I'm just fearing that with this seminar, seminar series, making my friends wake up at six and giving us a talk at seven and yeah. sabotaging my social life. But otherwise, <laughs> I think uh, we're all very, I know that we're all very fortunate to have you with us today, Earl. Thank you for taking the time and the floor is yours. Thanks for the intro, Moshi. That was pretty much my talk. Any, any questions? No, thank you very much for, that, for the invite, Moshi, and thank you for that very generous introduction. So I'll share my screen and just jump right in. Mm -hmm. uh, share screen. Share. Slide. Slide, Jim. There we go. Everybody see that okay? Awesome. Yeah, it's clear. Awesome. All right, well, again, thanks for that, that generous introduction, Moshi. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to see you. Um, so what do I do? What does my lab do? Well, my lab studies the executive brain functions, the brain functions that do the thinking, planning, focusing attention, learning, following rules, organized thoughts. And how we study them is by recording electrical signals from the brains of animals, sometimes humans, I collaborate with, with a lot of people, and we do uh, computational modeling and analytics to make sense of these signals. We basically throw a lot of math at these signals to try to in interpret them. And we do this because we wanna understand cognition, we wanna understand the brain, that's very cool, uh, very interesting, but also importantly, we wanna understand uh, cognitive dysfunction and diseases like autism, schizophrenia, and attention deficit disorder. And I'll talk about a couple of these things along, along the way. Now, what we study, as Moshi uh, mentioned, is, is the executive brain functions, the cognitive processes needed for cognitive control of behavior that direct your thoughts and actions towards goals. And this is thought to be a major function of the, of the prefrontal cortex. Cognitive control depends on our brain's ability to learn top-down information, the rules of the game, what goals are out there, what, what sort of behaviors in the past 
um, have been used to navigate these complex world we live in, these complex social situations, navigate them and direct them towards goals. All right, I guess we're good. All right, so um, about 20 years ago or so, we started a, a research program, a research program designed to learn how the prefrontal cortex absorbs and acquires this top-down information, these rules of the game of the goal relevant structure of our world. So this is about 20 so years ago now, we, we decided to ask the question of how does the brain makes categories and concepts? Categories and concepts are the basic knowledge that your brain has about the world. When you walk into a room, you instantly recognize things as tables or chairs. And you, even though you may have never seen those tables and chairs before, your brain automatically labels them and you know what to do with them. Now, previous work, like the, um, like the uh, Nobel Prize winning work of Hubel and Wiesel has shown that the nuts and bolts of how, how vision works in the sense that it breaks down, your primary visual cortex breaks down the scene in front of you into low level visual features like, like bars of light in certain places in the visual field. We wanted to say, we asked the question, how do you get from bars of light to things like abstract categories like peace, love and understanding? Um, of course, we didn't start with peace, love and understanding. We started more, Modestly, we trained monkeys to recognize a set of computer generated images as cats or dogs. And the way this worked is we had three prototype cat shapes, a house cat, a cheetah, and a mountain lion, and three prototype dogs. And we use a morphing algorithm developed in Tommy Poggio's lab, who we collaborated with on, in these experiments, to morph or blend these three prototype cats and these three prototype dogs. And what you see here is here's an example of these morphs. So this cat is gradually becoming this dog. This dog is gradually becoming this cat. So there's this smooth change in shape in the external world in, in the set of stimuli. Um, and this is just a small fraction of the stimuli we use in this experiment. We, they, we generate literally hundreds of them. But what we did is we trained our monkeys that there was a boundary there in this similar set that didn't actually exist in the real world. So we drew our boundary at the 50-50 line. Anything more than 50% 50, 50 cat was by definition a cat. Anything more than 50% dog is by definition a dog. So we're now imposing the sharp boundary in the world where it didn't actually exist before. And the animals learn this through, through experience. And what this sharp boundary does, it allows us to separate physical appearance from category membership. Because this cat, looks very different from this cat, but they belong to the same category. But at the same time, this cat looks, looks very similar to this dog, but they belong in different categories. So the boundary allowed, allowed us to separate out physical appearance from category membership. And after we spent um, a few weeks, a couple months training the monkeys on this task, we found that the prefrontal, we recorded randomly from neurons in the prefrontal cortex using electrode arrays. And we found that neurons in the prefrontal cortex signaled the category membership only. If we would have recorded from the prefrontal cortex before we did this training, we might find neurons that would respond to individual cats or dogs because they're picking up on the low level visual features that drive vision. But after training, the prefrontal cortex seemed to throw away all the little details about the individual stimuli and instead categorize this group of stimuli into these two different groups. So we found neurons that respond to all cats, regardless of which cat it was, and other neurons that respond to all dogs, regardless of, regardless of which dog it was. And here's an example, of just one neuron here in the prefrontal cortex. The, the each row of this is a is a is a morph line. So C1 to D1 is this morph line from this cat to that dog. The blue is the boundary. The color is the um, normalized firing rate, the spike rate, how many spikes per second this neuron is giving off. And you see that this neuron activated to all the different cat stimuli and did not activate to any of the dog stimuli. And again, this is even though all these cats look different from one another and all these dogs look different from one another, nonetheless, this neuron is categorizing them into these two groups. And of course, it's just one neuron. It, it was more um, activated the cats. Other neurons were more activated the dogs and so on. 
Now, so we thought this is maybe a principle about how, well, how the prefrontal cortex is involved in executive brain functions. It throws away the detail, irrelevant details of the world and just distills out the essence, what you need for, um, to solve the goal-directed task at hand. But we wanted to see if this was a general principle brain of a prefrontal cortex function, not just limited to this particular set of stimuli or this problem. So we did a series of experiments where we, Andreas Nieder, when he was in the lab, he trained monkeys to recognize the small numbers one through five. And again, we're displaying these numbers in different ways. And the monkeys learn to don't sweat the details. The details don't matter. Just tell us what the number is. Is it one, two, three, four, or five? And when um, Kathy Anderson and Joni Wallace and Muhammad were in the lab, they taught monkeys an even higher level of a concept or category, and that is the principles of same versus different. Monkeys switch between choosing stimuli that match one another versus choosing stimuli that were different from one another. So they were making same and different judgments, and we found neurons in the prefrontal cortex that much like they responded categorically to cat or dog, we found neurons that that um, a lot of neurons that, that were categorically responsive to numbers and a lot of neurons in the prefrontal cortex that were categorically responsive to these two different rules, choose same versus choose, choose different. And all this points to, this, to the same conclusion that what the prefrontal cortex does is it extracts the essence from experience. The big picture needed for the essence of information needed for top-down executive goal-directed behavior, throws away the details that are relevant to experience and just pulls out the essence of what, what's needed. Now, when we first did these studies about 20, first started about 20 years ago or so, we reported that many, this actually involved many, many neurons in the prefrontal cortex. We were Unlike the days of single electrode, single neuron recording, we weren't pre-selecting neurons for task-related responsiveness. We were recording from arrays of electrodes, randomly sampling as best we could any neurons we found. And we found anywhere from 30 to 40% of the neurons in the prefrontal cortex were showed the properties that I, I just uh, uh, um, had the properties I just showed you. The, selected between cats or dogs or numbers or same versus different. These are 30 to 40% of randomly selected neurons in, in, in the prefrontal cortex. And that was a surprise to us. We expected to find some neurons that would do this, but we didn't expect to find nearly half the population of neurons. And this is like, so it almost seemed like the task took over the brain. Like, like the monkeys were trained in this task for a few months and all of a sudden 40% of their neurons in the prefrontal cortex are solving the task. And that was a problem for the way we used to think about the brain, because we used to think about the brain as being a collection of specialized parts, specialized neurons. Every neuro, we used to think that every neuron had one function. This is way back in the 20th century when I was a student. We used to think every neuron had one function. So there were neurons that, that uh, responded to bars of light and you sum together, um, another neuron sums together the bars, bars of light neurons, and you get larger bars of light, and you sum those together and you get edges and you sum those together and you get complex shapes. And then there's a lot of neurons in your brain. So you sum enough neurons together and eventually you'll get the piece of understanding. So this is the way we used to think about the brain. Every neuron did one thing. And if you wire the neurons together in the right way, you'll get everything you need from brain function. So what, th what this suggested, was that a uh, neuron, the brain doesn't work by specialized, specialized neurons all wired together. Rather, there's something different going on. And the answer seemed to be that cortical neurons are not like clockwork. They're not specialized for individual functions. They're not, brain function isn't just wiring together of individualized specialized neurons. The answer seemed to be that cortical neurons are not like clockwork, they're multifunctional. Cortical neurons, especially in higher cortex, can do multiple things. They don't just do one thing. And we've shown this in other studies by, having an, by training animals to do multiple tasks. And we see the same neurons doing different things in different tasks. Now, when, we first, when John Duncan and I first presented this about 20 years ago or so, we actually got a little skepticism. We said, there's no, we know the brain, how the, can the brain work this way? How can neurons do multiple things? You're turning the brain into a bowl of porridge but you do the kind of body of work that we did. Other people started looking at this and it seemed to be true. There, there really were truly a lot of neurons in the, in the cortex devoted to each task and, there was a, and these neurons were multifunctional. But I think what, so gradually this idea um, became accepted, but I think what really 
tipped the, the scale over towards acceptance is work done by my colleagues, uh, Stefano Fusi and Mattia Regatta at um, Columbia University. And what they showed computationally is that your brain needs multifunctional neurons. They, we call them mixed select selectivity neurons. And what they showed mathematically is that by using computational modeling and a combination of a, with combination with data analysis, they showed that these multifunctional mixed selectivity neurons are like a neural bazaar where a wide range of information can interact. You have these neurons in the prefrontal cortex that can do multiple things. That means all this relevant information about how to navigate our world is all commingling in this one network of neurons. And what this does is it makes the brain smarter for a whole bunch of mathy reasons I won't go into details with. It allows the brain to solve more complex problems because it represents information in a higher dimensional space. It also increases the brain storage capacity. They showed that if you have a neural network, a computational model where every neuron does one thing, there's a severe limitation on how many tasks that, that network can, can, can learn. But if you have a um, if you have multifunctional neurons, mixed selectivity neurons in this in this computational model, the comp the storage capacity of the network goes essentially unlimited. And it also allows faster learning and, co and cognitive flexibility because all this information is intermingling there. So if you want to learn some arbitrary rule, like red means stop and green means go, that information can be pulled together really quickly in the prefrontal cortex because of these multifunctional mixed selectivity neurons. But multifunctionality, this idea of multifunctionality, mixed selectivity, doesn't really fit with this prior view we had of the brain, of this clockwork brain where things are wired together in a specific way to produce brain function. Because the clockwork paradigm says that anatomy is destiny. If neurons have a physical connection, they'll activate one another. And the way you get higher order representations in the brain is by combining the activity of other neurons in a very specific, precise way. In fact, it used to be thought that every perception, thought, and action we have has a unique network, a neural ensemble, a unique collection of neurons that corresponds to my perception of a cat versus a dog. Any thought, any action I have, there's a unique network of neurons, a unique ensemble that underlies it because of this view that the brain works by actual physical connections of specialized neurons. So it's thought to, it was, it was thought largely to work like this. You have one thought, let's say the category of a cat, or another thought, the category of dog, and there was a unique anatomical network of neurons that corresponded to the cat, and a different unique set of neurons, network of neurons, that corresponded to the dog. Well, if this is how the brain, if anatomy is destiny, what multifunctionality suggests is that it doesn't work like that. It must work like this. If neurons are multifunctional, they must participate in, in a variety of different ensembles, not just one ensemble. And that's what I've illustrated here. Here we have our two networks, but now they're co-mingling. They're lying on top of one another. And these two networks, these two ensembles, share many common elements, the multifunctional neurons. So the, it's a higher level cognition. It isn't just individual ensembles. It's networks lying on top of networks, all sharing different, uh, different uh, units, different, different neural elements. But if anatomy is destiny, how does this work? I mean, if I want to think my uh, um, thought of dog or cat, I want to activate this blue network. If anatomy was everything in the brain, if I try to activate the blue network, the activity will run through these multifunctional neurons to the red network. Then you have both networks activated, and your brain is a thoughts are a, are a mush. So how does it, how does this work? Well. A, a number of us have um, gradually come to the conclusion that the solution to this is brain waves. So brain waves are synchronized activity of millions of neurons oscillating together. You sure you're all familiar with the concept of brain waves. If you record EEG from the scalp, you'll get squiggly lines on a, on a oscilloscope screen that reflects neurons activating and deactivating activating together in slow waves like delta or faster waves like beta or even higher or faster waves like, like gamma, which is 40 hertz and above. Now, so far I've discussed spikes, which are um, activity of individual neurons, so the voices of individual neurons, but brain waves are an emergent property. They're the product of crowds of millions of neurons all activating in a coordinated way. So here's a crowd doing the wave 
and you see the crowd wave going from uh, right to left here. If I was recording from individual neurons, individual voices in this crowd, like we used to back in the uh, 1980s, um, I could hear what individual people are talking about in this crowd. I would know a great deal about the individual, but I would have no idea that this wave is going on. Um, I only know this um, wave is going on by looking at the greater structure by looking at all the what the crowd is what a whole bunch of people in the crowd are doing simultaneously. I can't do it one one person, one neuron at a time. So but brain waves, and this is so brain waves are a way of coordinating um, activity in the brain and actually forming groups or networks of neurons in a in a in an emergent property way, in an on-the-fly kind of way. But back in the 20th century, when the focus was on individual neurons or uh, individual brain parts that are specialized, brain waves were dismissed as kind of being like the humming of a car engine. They're a byproduct, they reflect the engine running, the brain waves reflect the brain working, but they don't actually make the, the brain run, just like the humming of an engine reflects the engine running, but doesn't make the engine run. But now we've come to realize that your brain, that they actually play an important role in neural communication, that your brain kind of works like FM radio, that brain waves are a backbone of communication in the cortex. And the way this works is that networks form, ensembles form by synchronizing the rhythms of individual neurons. Neurons that, uh, networks form, ensembles form when neurons synchronize their rhythms. So we have our, now we have our two ensembles here, our red ensemble and our blue ensemble. And we know that the neurons form the red ensemble because their rhythms are synchronized together. Whereas the neurons forming the blue ensemble, they have a different rhythm or a different phase or a different pattern of synchrony. And that's how we know that these two neurons, two sets of neurons are two separate networks, two separate ensembles. It's like the crowd sitting together in the stands, but the people sitting together are doing two different sets of waves. You can tell which, which people belong to which crowd, which group by which wave they're doing. So the idea is that neurons that hum together temporarily wire together. And this allows cognitive flexibility because you know you can learn new things really quickly. You change your mind from moment to moment. If networks are formed by synchronizing these patterns of, of, um, of brain waves, synchronizing these rhythms, that means that you could form networks, form and unform and rewire form networks on the fly in your brain without having to rewire the anatomy in your brain. It takes time to um, change anatomy in your brain, but these resonance patterns can form and they're stable for a while, then you can break them apart and form new resonance patterns. Therefore, you can form new networks on the fly and you get cognitive flexibility and rapid learning. So the way to think about this is brain anatomy is not destiny in your brain. Brain anatomy is like possibility. Brain anatomy is like the road and highway system. It just specifies where traffic could go, but Brainwave patterns actually direct where traffic does go from moment to moment on the road and highway system. Now, I'm not saying anatomy isn't important. You need the road and highway system. You need this infrastructure so traffic has some constraint and some direction, but that's only potential. Where traffic goes from moment to moment depends on these um, synchronized patterns of brainwaves, which act like a traffic cop or road signs that tell the traffic where to go from time, moment to moment. Now, when Tim Bushman was in my lab, a um, number of years ago now, Tim is now a, a professor at Princeton University. Um, he did one of the first studies to demonstrate this. What he did is he trained monkeys to switch back and forth between two different rules. The monkeys were making judgments about colored oriented bars. The bars were either red or blue, or they were vertical or horizontal. And he cued the monkey on trial to trial, whether to make a judgment based on the color or make a judgment based on the orientation. Then you recorded from the prefrontal cortex using arrays of electrodes. Um, and this, is, this summarizes what he found. This is the prefrontal cortex of monkeys. This is the arcuate sulcus, uh, principal sulcus. Uh, this would be posterior, that's anterior. It'd be like right here on the side of my head with, with uh, this side being forward, anterior, that being posterior, dorsal versus ventral. And each of these circles is a different recording site where we had an electrode, an ele electrode array. And what the colored lines show is they connect recording sites that showed a significant increase in synchrony of local field potentials. So I haven't talked about local field potentials, that local field potentials are like the 
unlike spikes, which are the voices of individual neurons, local field potentials or LFPs are like the voices of local crowds. They're the summed activity of, a, of, a, of millions of neurons all in one location, all activating together. And what these colored lines shows are what shows where there was an increase in LFP synchrony. LFP synchrony uh, between recording sites uh, uh, whenever the animal was um, performing the color rule versus when the animal was performing the orientation rule. So when the monkey was forming the color rule, these sets of recording sites synchronized together. And when the monkey was forming the orient was following the orientation rule, these different set of recording sites showed a significant increase in local field potential synchrony. Now we looked across all frequencies from one hertz to nearly 100 hertz, and we found that this occurred in the beta band. This, these, these shifting patterns of resonance with, with, the, with the rules were limited to the 12 to 30 hertz um, uh, frequency band. So so this suggested that, that these rhythms are really are playing a, a role in, in uh, forming ensembles in the brain. For a further example of this, I'll turn to another study where we, we, we studied the neural basis of working memory by training monkeys to remember two colored screens over, over a brief delay. So this is the details of the task here. It's, the details aren't that important. We showed the monkey two colored squares that after a memory delay, the same two colored squares appeared, except one of them may change color. And if it changed color, the monkey has to make a saccade to it. The important thing is that the monkey has to remember two or three colored squares over a working memory delay of a, lasting about a second or so. And this is what we found. This is work by Michael Lundquist when he was in the laboratory. And what Michael did is he did something different than previous studies of working memory. Previous studies of working memory, first of all, forced on, um, focused on spiking activity, and they did a lot of averaging across trials. You, 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 you study uh, the monkey holding a particular stimulus in memory over a working memory delay, and you do 20 or so trials of that, 20 trials of another stimulus, and you average. Well, average increases the sig average signal noise ratio from your, from your spiking data, but it throws away a lot of the details of what's going on on the trial by trial real time level. And what Michael found out was that if you look on individual trials in real time, you find some, you find that the um, neural correlates of working memory are actually more complex than we thought. And what Michael found was that when the monkey's performing its working memory test, there's these bursts of gamma oscillations, bursts of 40 Hertz and above oscillations. In, in the local field potentials um, that were very, very brief, very, very sparse and periodic during, during, the, during the tasks. And that's what's shown here. Here's these bursts of gamma oscillations. This is a, just a single trial from, from the monkey. These are local field potentials. There's these bursts of gamma as the animals encoding the stimulus into working memory and holding it over the delay. So here's frequency on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. S1 and S2 are the two stimuli, the two squares we presented to the animal to hold in working memory. And you see these gamma bursts when the animal is encoding the stimulus in the working memory, and then occasional gamma bursts during the working memory delay. When you, when you core from spikes, and that's where the, the spikes were actually conveying the actual working memories, we found that the spikes carrying the working memories were associated with these gamma bursts. So all the spikes carrying information about the two stimuli the monkeys encoding and holding a working memory, they occurred coincident in time with these gamma bursts. We also found that there was beta bursts, lower frequency beta bursts below about 25, 30 Hertz or so that also occurred, but they were anti-correlated with, with, with the beta. The beta was not associated with spiking that's carrying the working memories, but they were anti-correlated with beta. You can see that here, that the beta bursts are occurring around the times of gamma bursts are not. So there's our beta bursts. And if you look at, now we're averaging across trials and you look across time, here's the burst rate of gamma as a function of time during the trial. Burst rate on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. Here's the two stimuli the monkey's being cued with. Here's the working memory delay. And here's the burst rate of gamma. Gamma bursts go up. When the animal's encoding the information in working memory, they drop down early in the memory delay, then build up gradually over, over, the, over the delay. Beta shows the exact opposite. Beta is like a mirror image of gamma. Now, I mentioned that, that 
gamma is associated with the spikes that are actually carrying the working memories, the actual pictures the monkey's holding in mind, the two squares the monkey's holding in mind. If gamma is associated with the contents of working memory, what's beta doing? Well, you may remember I just mentioned that what beta seems to be doing is actually carrying the rules the animal's using to solve the task. These patterns of beta are associated with the top-down information, the rule information the animal needs to know what to do in the task, know to pay attention to the stimuli, know to make a response. It's the rules the animal's using to solve the task. So we found these different patterns of brain wave synchrony for a wide variety of top-down information, not just the uh, um, pay attention to color orientation. Once Tim Bushman made that discovery in the lab, we went back, we did further experiments. We looked at our old data, cat and dog data. Every time we looked at some top-down information, rules, categories, same versus different, cat versus dog, we found the same thing, that, that these, this top-down information is carried in these patterns of brainwave synchrony, beta brainwave synchrony. The spikes were carrying the contents of working memory, but the beta patterns of beta brainwave synchrony were carrying the rules the animals were using to solve, to solve the task. So what this suggested to us is this is, could be a potential mechanism for volitional control of working memory. The idea was that beta is carrying the top-down information the animal needs to, to, uh, for top-down control of working memory to the rules to solve the task. And because of this anti-correlation, maybe beta has this inhibitory influence on gamma. Therefore, beta can act like a gating mechanism that controls access to working memory. If you want to encode information in working memory, you drop beta down, gamma goes up, information gets encoded in working memory. You maintain information in working memory by keeping beta low. But then you want to clear out working memory, you drive up beta, and that drives down gamma and working memory is cleared out because all the spiking that's, that's carrying the contents of working memory is associated with gamma. And once it's inhibited, no more working memory. And in this study here, we actually showed these operations, these dance between beta and gamma working to control access, access to working memory. But when Andre Bastos was in the lab and Roman Lunas is in the lab, they wanted to look more closely at this inter interplay between beta and gamma. And what they did is they used laminar probes, so-called laminar probes. These are electrodes that have multiple contacts along the shaft in order to record from all the layers of cortex simultaneously. As you probably all know, cortex has six layers. And the reason why they wanted to do this experiment to record from different layers, look at these beta gamma interactions is because we know anatomically that the superficial layers of cortex, everything above layer four, are the feed forward layers of cortex that carry sensory information from sensory cortex up to the prefrontal cortex. Those are the superficial layers. Whereas the deep layers of cortex, everything below layer four, are the feedback layers of cortex that presumably carry top-down information from your prefrontal cortex back to the rest of your brain and provide this control. So what the first thing they, they noticed is that when you look at spiking activity uh, in the prefrontal cortex, that, the, that there was more spiking activity carrying working memory in the superficial layers of cortex. So here's a plot showing the layers of cortex on the y-axis. This is time on the x-axis. It's a working memory task. This is when the animal was given a stimulus to hold in working memory. Here's the working memory delay. This dotted line is layer four or the middle layer. And the, um, there was more spiking related to carrying the stimulus, holding this contents of working memory in the superficial layers of cortex and the deep layers. And that makes sense because we're cueing the animal with a sensory stimulus to hold in working memory. The superficial layers are feed forward layers. They should be where this bottom up sensory information is processed and maintained, and they are. And now when they looked at the gamma versus beta, Here's a plot of now the, the cortical layers, again, superficial layers on top, deep layers in the bottom. Um, this shows power on the x-axis. The blue line is the gamma power as a function of layer. The red line is the beta power as a function of layer. And what we see is we see more gamma in the superficial layers of cortex. And again, that makes sense because the superficial layers, the feed forward layers, gamma is associated with bottom up sensory processing with sensory information. So they should, more gamma should be in the superficial layers, but there was more beta in the deep layers of cortex. 
And that makes sense because the, we were proposing that beta is actually carrying top-down information from the frontal cortex, feeding it back to the rest of the cortex. So beta should be stronger in the feedback or deep layers of cortex, and it was. And if you look at this anti-correlation between beta and gamma, like I showed you earlier, you see it playing out between the deep layer and superficial layers of cortex. So this plot shows the correlation between beta and gamma as a function of whether the beta or gamma is coming from superficial versus deep layers of cortex. And what this plot really shows is that when beta is high in the deep layers of cortex, gamma is low in the superficial layers of cortex. And when gamma is high in the superficial layers of cortex, it's low in the deep layers of cortex. So the same anti-correlation push-pull playing out between deep and superficial layers of cortex. So this suggests that top-down information is carried by beta rhythms in the feedback or deep layers of cortex, and it has this gating inhibitory influence over the feed-forwarding of, of sensory information, bottom-up sensory information in the, in the uh, uh, um, carried by gamma in the superficial layers of cortex. So the idea here is that top-down information is carried by deep layer beta in cortex. Deep layer beta, now there's both beta and gamma in superficial layers of, and deep layers of cortex, just that one is stronger than the other. And we did things like Granger's causality measures. And what we discovered was that, top, that deep layer beta is regulating weaker superficial layer beta. And superficial layer beta, in turn, has this inhibitory relationship to superficial layer gamma and the spiking that's encoding information in working memory and storing information in working memory. So, so that, that was the idea, this, this, uh, this push-pull between deep, between beta and gamma and deep layers and superficial layers of cortex gating access to working memory. Now to show you another example of how this may, may work is that we recently started studying how working memory is coordinated between the right and left cerebral cortices. So, it used to be thought, we know, we know this from our anatomy classes, that the right and left sides of vision are split between the right and left cerebral hemispheres. Your, your, uh, your primary visual cortex, your right um, primary visual cortex sees the left half of vision, and your left visual cortex sees the right half of vision. And it used to be thought when I was, when I was a student that somehow the split between left and right is somehow healed up in higher cortex presumably in prefrontal cortex, which is about higher level cognition, somehow it's all put together up there. The, right, the split between right and left is split, is, is somehow healed in the prefrontal cortex. But this is not true. And another series of work that um, Tim Bushman and Demetrius Pinosis did, Simon Kornbluth did in the lab, is we found that when you, when you record from both sides of the brain simultaneously, that the split between right and left is even true in working memory. In fact, you have seemed to have separate working memory stores uh, for the right and left sides of vision in your left versus right prefrontal cortex. So visual cognition seems seamless. If I'm playing Frisbee or watching, you know, sports or something, I don't recognize the split between the left and right. If it's still split, even at the level of the prefrontal cortex, how does the brain manage to pull together the right and left sides of vision? So Scott Brinkett did an experiment in the lab where what he did is he trained monkeys to uh, in a task where we loaded working memory on one side of vision, then, the monk, then we did a little behavioral trick to encourage the monkeys to move the memory to the other, other side of the brain. And the way this works is that they, we have the animal fixate a spot of light, maintain its gaze on a spot of light at the, set, at the one side of a computer screen, and we presented a stimulus to hold a working memory, like this banana, to one side of vision. So the, because the banana is appearing on the right side of vision, that will go to the left prefrontal cortex. Then on one half of the trials, we had the animal move its gaze to the other side of vision during the working memory delay. Other half of the trials, the monkey just kept its eye where, where it started. Now, if the stimulus was still on the screen, which it's not, the monkey's just holding it in mind, if the stimulus was still on the screen, if the animal moved its, its eye to the other side of the computer screen from left to right, that would move processing, move the banana to the other side of vision. But the animal, the stimulus is not on the screen, the animal's just holding it in mind. So we thought this might possibly induce the brain to switch the location of the, of the working memory to the other side of the brain. And 
That's what we found exactly happened. So here's early in the working memory delay. These are spikes related to a stimulus that appear on the contralateral side of vision, contralateral to where we were recording, and spiking activity to a stimulus on the ipsilateral side. And of course, because vision is split um, and it's crossed over between the right and left, there's more activity when a stimulus is on the contralateral side versus ipsilateral side. Then right here is where the animal made its saccade to the other side of the computer screen, left to right or right to left. And what happened after that? Well, these lines here, this line, that line, shows what happens on trials in which the, the eye didn't move. The animal just maintained its, its gaze where it was before. And we see this contralateral versus ipsilateral bias just carry through the memory delay as expected. But these two lines here, this line, this line, shows what happens on the trials when the monkey moved its eye to the other side of the screen. And we can see that we see a flip. There's a bit of activation here because the animal's moving its eye. Then the contralateral signal drops down to where it would be for ipsilateral stimuli. And the ipsilateral stimuli, when the monkey moves its eye, it now becomes like a contralateral signal. So it shows that the working memory is the working memory traces are disappearing from the one side of, of, the, of the prefrontal cortex and reappearing on the other side of, of, the, of the prefrontal prefrontal cortex on the other side of the brain as a result of this eye movement. So memories are actually being transferred from one cerebral hemisphere to another as a result of the, this change in gaze. Well, we found these beta gamma dynamics also played a role in this shift of working memory from one hemisphere to another. So here's now the um, synchrony, LFP synchrony between the right and left prefrontal cortex as a function of time during the trial and frequency. And here's where the animal made its saccade that would move the um, stimulus from one side of the brain to the other. And what we found is around the time the animal moved the sign and the memory was being transferred, there was a decrease in beta synchrony between the right and left prefrontal cortex. And it, after this decrease in beta synchrony, there was an increase in ga gamma, uh, gamma theta synchrony. I didn't talk about theta yet, but theta is, is weak in cortex, but it tracks along with gamma. So you have gamma and theta working together, and in between is beta, which has this inhibitory relationship to, to gamma and theta. But around the time the working memory is being transferred, beta drops. That allows gamma synchrony to increase between the prefrontal cortex on both sides, and now the working memory gets transferred. So beta is playing this role in gating the, the transfer of working memory between the two right and left prefrontal cortex. And we did a Granger's causality measure of the directionality from right to left or right to left brain. Um, when we did this, we found out that the directionality of influence was always from this, in the same direction as the memory transfer. The influence was from the sender receiver to the receiver to the receiver hemisphere. So if the if the if the memory is being switched from left to right, the directionality of the synchrony was from left to right. If the memory is being transferred from right to left the synchrony, directionality of the synchrony was in the opposite direction. So, so we see that this, this, this push-pull between beta and gamma plays this role in controlling working memory, whether it's gaining access to working memory or actually moving working memories from one side of your brain to another. But then we thought, well, why should this tr be true just for, uh, if it play, if, Beta and gamma play this important way in which top-down can control bottom-up. Why should it be true just for working memory? Bottom-up and top-down is important for all sorts of cortical functions. And indeed, when Michael Lundqvist is in the laboratory, he did a study where we recorded from all over the cortex, from frontal cortex, parietal cortex, areas of visual cortex, and found these same dynamics, beta, gamma, push-pull, was true everywhere we looked in cortex. Now, one this, this suggests that this, this is not just due to not just a mechanism for working memory, it's a mechanism for cortical functioning in general. And one thing I'll mention is that a curious thing was that if the actual, the exact frequency of where you see these power, beta, gamma stuff, it, it actually starts out, it's relatively lower frequency in the back of the brain, and they gradually increase as you move up to frontal cortex. Now I mention this because that means that the gamma shifts from a lower gamma to a higher gamma as you go from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. And in, in the alpha beta range, in, in beta, so beta in frontal cortex, I mean, when, you, when you go back into sensory cortex, it drops in frequency a little bit, so it becomes alpha. 
So essentially, alpha in, in visual cortex gradually increases to become beta in visual cortex. So now I'm going to be talking about the com alpha beta um, instead of just beta, because uh, alpha it's it's in the alpha beta range, and it's, whether it's more beta or alpha depends on where you are anatomically in the cortex. So we thought, well, this push pull dynamics may play an important role in a very fundamental cortical function known as predictive coding. Predictive coding, your brain is constantly making models of the environment. Your brain does this to anticipate forthcoming sensory inputs, sensory inputs coming in the next second or so. Now, why do you need that? Because what your brain does is it uses this to suppress processing of predicted visual inputs or predict any predicted sensory input. And you need this because you don't need to process predicted sensory inputs because you were able to predict them. Therefore, they're not very informative. Instead, unexpected inputs, prediction errors, are fed forward to update the mental model. If the input was unexpected, something new must happen, something different must happen, something you couldn't predict, so you need to process that stimulus fully and update, update your mental model. Now, this is important because if your brain couldn't filter out most of your sensory inputs, you would quickly become overwhelmed and have sensory overload, the kind of sensory overload you see in autism. Now, I think it's kind of universal agreement that predictive coding is happening in your brain, but the question is, how does it happen? What's the neural basis of it? How does it actually happen in, um, in, in cortex? Now, many models predict that there's these specialized circuits at every level of cortical processing that test the mismatch, test for a mismatch between input and prediction. And we thought maybe with these beta and gamma, alpha, beta, and gamma dynamics, that there's a more parsimonious explanation. And here's our explanation, here's our, our, our prediction, our hypothesis, is that alpha predictions from the fun, are carried from the front of your brain to the back of the brain via these alpha, beta, top-down um, feedback signals. And these predictions carried by alpha, beta inhibit the gamma and spiking in the sensory cortex pathways that process a predicted sensory input. So that's how you filter out sensory inputs. You have alpha beta carrying actual predictions, um, suppressing the circuits, gamma in the circuits and sensory cortex that correspond to that predicted stimulus. And therefore prediction errors are just the gamma and spiking fed forward by pathways that were not affected by the um, alpha beta predictions. So we tested this recently, Andre Bassos in collaboration with uh, Nancy Capel's laboratory, BU, we tested this by having the animal form a working memory task where the monkey, uh, we recorded from all these different cortical areas. And the monkey was uh, performing this working memory task where it had a, um, a sequence of, of uh, trials in which the sample stimulus, the monkey's holding a sample stimulus of working memory. Here's the delay. And the monkey has to choose that stimulus among a bunch of alternatives. We had a block of trials in which the sample stimulus was fully predicted. It was the same stimulus for 50 trials in a row. Then we had a block of trials in which the sample stimulus was relatively unpredicted. There was uh, six stimuli used in this task and we, they were chosen at random. So it was relatively unpredictable. And this is what we found. We found that when the monkey was performing a working memory task in which the stimuli were unpredictable, there was greater gamma coherence between different cortical areas. And when the monkey was performing a block of trials in which the stimulus was highly predictable, there was greater alpha beta coherence between the areas. And this is consistent with the idea that gamma is feeding forward prediction errors of unpredicted, uh, unpre unpre unpredicted uh, inputs, but the alpha beta is carrying the predictions. So what's shown here are the different areas we recorded from. Here's the frontal cortex, frontal eye fields, prefrontal cortex, visual area V4, and two areas in the parietal cortex, 7A and area LIP. And here is the... Um, the, the color line shows where we saw more coherence for predicted objects in blue, unpredicted objects in, um, in a, sorry, predicted uh, um, greater alpha beta coherence to predicted objects is shown in blue, greater gamma coherence to unpredicted objects is shown in red, and the thickness of the lines indicates the degree of coherence. So we see whenever, when the, when the animal is, um, is uh, using working memory tasks with predictable stimuli, we see a greater increase in alpha beta coherence between the different cortical areas. And when the animal is 
viewing an unpredicted stimulus, a prediction error, we see greater gamma coherence. And the gamma coherence was stronger in the feed forward direction from sensory cortex to frontal cortex, consistent with this prediction error being fed forward. And the alpha beta coherence was stronger in the feedback direction from frontal cortex back through parietal to sensory cortex. And furthermore, we found these effects were stimulus specific. The coherent effects were strongest at the recording sites where the spiking at that site in sensory cortex actually preferred that specific predicted or unpredicted stimulus. So it isn't just a wave of alpha or a wave of gamma that's just undifferentiated. It's actually carrying specific predictions about specific stimuli or feeding forward prediction errors about specific stimuli. The last thing I'll talk about, so that, that so that we're now carrying this further, this work further by trying to, um, uh, we're, we're doing experiments where we're um, deactivating alpha beta uh, coherence in deep layers of frontal cortex and seeing what effects that it has on sensory cortex. So um, we're trying actual cause and effects manipulations, see if we can produce prediction errors, or for that matter, the kind of sensory overload one sees in autism by manipulating these alpha beta prediction signals. Now, the last experiment I'll tell you about um, with the role of brain waves in, uh, in cortical function is a series of experiments that we're doing now in collaboration with Emory Brown's lab at, at MIT. And we're looking at um, why is it that we're asking the question of why does general anesthesia cause a loss of consciousness? It may be a little unsettling to know, but although we've used anesthesia for over 100 years now, no one really knows why it works. We just know that it works. And it used to kind of be thought that what anesthesia must do, it must just simply shut off your brain. What we found in these experiments is that anesthesia doesn't just shut off your brain, it changes your brain wave profile. So here is recordings from a bunch of different cortical areas. This STG is the auditory cortex. Here's parietal cortex, prefrontal cortex, frontal eye fields. These are local field potentials. And these are spikes, and this is a chunk of time during one of our recording sessions. And this shows again, spikes are the active individual neurons, LFPs are the roars of local crowds. And when you're, when you, when the monkey, when you and we are in a normal awake state, you see a lot of high frequency chatter, lots of spiking going on, and you see low amplitude, high frequency um, signals in the LFPs because presumably all these different networks are all chatting together at different frequencies, so a lot of high frequency chatter going on. But then we anesthetize the animal using a common anesthetic called propofol that's widely used in humans. And we found that all this high frequency chatter in the cortex is replaced by a low frequency hum. And what you can see here is that after the animal loses consciousness, there's now these low frequency one hertz signals that swamp the brain. And all the spiking in these cortical areas, they revert from a lot of different high frequency chatter, a lot of high frequency spiking. They revert to these up and down states, up, state, up states of high activity, down states of low activity that are synchronized to these low frequency one hertz hum. So anesthesia makes you unconscious because it doesn't turn off your brain. It drastically changes the brainwave profile. It replaces all the high frequency stuff we associate with consciousness and replaces it with this low frequency hum that's incompatible with consciousness. Now you want to test this more directly by seeing if you could wake the animals up when they were unconscious. So they're, they're getting this infusion of propofol. We haven't stopped the anesthetic. We want to see if we can wake the animals up by replacing these high frequencies in cortex via electrical stimulation. And that's what we did. We stimulated the, um, the, the thalamus. Thalamus has these loops to cortex and we used high frequency electrical stimulation of the thalamus while the animals were unconscious. And when we applied that to the thalamus, high frequencies returned to the cortex and the animals woke up. They were like you, totally unconscious at first, just slumped over in their seats. And as you apply this high frequency stimulation, they sit up, they wake up, their blood pressure goes up, they open their eyes, they start responding to sensory stimulus again. They're a little groggy, but essentially we, we restored consciousness by this high frequency stimulation in the thalamus. And when you turn off the, the stimulation, the animals go back on, on, um, to the unconscious state. 
So we're using these methods in collaboration at Lemry's lab to try to develop safer methods of delivering anesthesia. If we know what the sig signature is from consciousness and we can record from the EEG of humans, while they're going under uh, undergoing surgery, we can more better titrate the exact amount of anesthesia you're getting so we don't over anesthetize people. So in summary, we think that alpha beta is like a control signal that feeds back top down information through the cortex via deep layers of cortex. It regulates the expression of gamma in superficial layers of cortex that traffic bottom up sensing information. And we think that we see, we're seeing this all over cortex and a, in a wide variety of uh, situations, not only for control of working memory, but also for predictive coding and even the transfer of memories between cerebral hemispheres. So we think this beta gamma cortical motif between deep layer and superficial layer cortex is a general cortical circuit, a general cortical motif that allows your brain to use top down information to regulate the processing of bottom up information in your brain. And I thank you for your attention and thank you for all the people in my lab who do all the real hard work in, uh, in, um, make, in producing the, these results. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very glad that everybody here glad to, glad, uh, got to, ex to be exposed to your research. So uh, questions from students maybe first? Yes, hi Earl. Hi. Um, hi. Uh, thank you for this great talk. It was really amazing. I was wondering, because you mentioned schizophrenia uh, way in the back in the start of the talk, yeah. and I was wondering, uh, I, you probably want to switch to the predictive coding slide so we can <laughs> look right. at that. And uh, I was wondering how uh, schizophrenia would fit in that model. Would you say that predictions are being driven harder, therefore nothing creates this mismatch negativity. So more beta uh, alpha waves than gamma theta. You just answered the question, that's exactly right. And it's, a, it's, um, it's been thought that predictive coding can explain both autism. You have, with autism, you have the prediction error, no, sorry, the predictions, the alpha beta prediction signals are weakened. Therefore, every single stimulus that comes along is a prediction error, and it just floods your cortex with too much sensory information. And the idea, and this is not our idea, this is in the literature, the opposite of predictive coding can explain schizophrenia because you have too much predictions and there's no reality check from the outside world to uh, confirm or refute those predictions. So too much predictions would be, would be uh, schizophrenia where autism is too little predictions. Yeah, so in that manner, do, do you have any, like, I don't know, preliminary data uh, accounting for that on schizo uh, schizophrenia uh, population? Well, not yet, but give me time. Uh, we do know that, uh, that uh, uh, schizophrenics tend to show a decrease in around low gamma um, power in, 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 in the cortex. Sorry, uh, 40 hertz. So interesting, schizophrenics show a decrease in just that nexus between alpha, beta, and gamma, right at that interface between, between the two. So right there, so, so we know that from the literature, how that plays into this whole predictive coding model is something we hope to do um, address in the future. Got you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, um, if I may ask a question. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. Incredibly fascinating. Um, I wondered, because I've been reading about oscillations and I read that depending on the characteristics that you use, uh, oscillations or rhythms in the brain are actually a lot more rare than we used to think. Um, and I was curious to hear your thoughts about this because you speak a lot about oscillations and rhythms. Um, so I'm just curious to hear what you think about it and how it would like influence your interpretation um, in the network of rhythms, for example. Well, we want oscillations to be more on the rare, not more on the rare side than ubiquitous because you don't get specificity if you don't have uh, um, targeted um, oscillations. I know you're probably referring to the work of Brad Wojtek, who's done a great job developing tools and saying like, his, his attitude is that an oscillation is not always an oscillation. That's fine, we got to better refine our techniques so we can get more precise information about what these patterns of, of um, oscillations are doing. But I've talked to Brett about this and he agrees that you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, just because it's more rare and specific than we thought, that's actually kind of a good thing because it means it could play a more specific role in brain function. But we don't 
not going to, he, he's not an advocate for throwing away the whole idea of stu studying, studying oscillations. But yeah, we want it to be more specific and targeted than just something that just blasts the cortex in a not, not differentiated way. But Brad's doing very valuable work so we can better refine our tools to identify the oscillations so we could better define their role in brain function. Excellent. Ariel, I have a question actually. Hi, sure. Hey. Uh, so thanks for the talk. I, I was really curious about how actually the, this kind of turns into a rule. So I'm learning that uh, rhythms are important for something, and this go comes. To, it's encoded through gamma going up in a feed forward, and it arrives somewhere to these prefrontal cortices, and it hits these assemblies, and then this kind of bottom-up information turns into a rule. And how does that happen between the individual neurons and the ensemble? And this happens quite rapidly, right? Oh, Roy, I wish I knew. <laughs> if I knew, we would have figured out the brain by now. We could all go home. Uh, no, I mean, I can give you some hand wavy explanations that we've done some other studies that show that rule learning depends on loops between the basal ganglia and prefrontal cortex. And these are closed anatomical loops and they're gated by dopamine, which uh, says dopamine says you did something good, you reached some goal, now learn. So, you know, there's these, these teaching signals that people like Wolfram Schultz identify, but there's these loops in the basal ganglia and, and the prefrontal cortex and they're closed anatomical loops, like a snake eating its own tail. And what closed loops are good for are recursive processing where the brain can bootstrap itself up in, into like higher order representations. So somehow some of this recursive bootstrapping process driven by dopamine is producing these patterns of activity that reflect the rules. And John Cohn and I published back in 2001, we published this idea long before we were considering oscillations, but that these patterns activity in the prefrontal cortex, they aren't just the logic of a task, but they are the logic of the task expressed in terms of which pathways in posterior cortex need to be activated in order to perform that task. So somehow that, that bootstrapping operations produces these, 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 uh, this rule information as expressed in these patterns of cort cortical circuits. Um, as for, you know, all I got have now is a ha the hand wavy thing, but you know, this is working. There's still plenty to do for figuring out the brain. Anna, thank you. Thanks. Anybody else? Um, I have one more question, actually. Um, the last study you discussed on um, uh, anesthesia and consciousness, I wondered if, uh, if you think that this sort of method of uh, high frequency stimulation of the thalamus is maybe applicable to like disorders of consciousness or if you're going to draw the, draw the line there or if it's well, distinctively work, different. That's a great question. Our work was inspired by the, by the work of Nico Schiff. And what he did, he, he actually woke up minimally conscious patients by stimulating their thalamus. In fact, in fact he was a, 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 a consultant on our study and showed us how to get to the thalamus and, 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 the, and we used the stimulation parameters from study, his study in minimally conscious patients. And these patients wake up when, when, when their when thalamic stimulation is applied. I don't see this being uh, something that we can use in the surgery um, under human surgery time soon because it, it does require actually uh, you know stimulate invasive stimulation. But on the other hand, our because of these work on rhythms, our lab is also working on um, more precise ways of non-invasive transcranial stimulation that we can maybe use to treat things like autism by by strengthening the prediction signals. And it's possible in theory you could maybe wake up people by by high frequency non-invasive electrical stimulation. Although it's a little more difficult for non-invasive stimulation because your skull and your muscles is a big filter. So it's easier to get a hold of lower frequencies non-invasively than it is higher frequencies. So I don't have a lot of promise for that for, for stimulation being used to wake up surgery patients, but the I, we are actually working and we have a, um, funding now to work on a project where we're gonna use a closed loop anesthesia system that reads EEG from human patients and uses it to titrate the exact amount of anesthesia needed to maintain consciousness or unconsciousness. Very cool. <laughs> yes, crazy. Well, just a little question about this uh, stunning result that you went over pretty quickly. Uh, you're finding about different working memory capacities in the right and the left. Do you notice uh, preferred material or preferred co uh, content for the right and left working memories or they're equal, but just different inside capacity? 
they're equal, but different. They're, they're different in capacity. We haven't noticed anything from materials. Um, so we do this work in monkeys, obviously. But my colleague Ed Vogel has been doing the follow-up studies in humans, and he studied like a thousand people so far, including he has a satellite lab in, in uh, China and studied people there. So what the base finding is that people have different. Everybody's like a split brain patient when it comes to working memory. You have independent capacities for working memory on the right and left. Any, when you have stimulus on, on the left, stimuli on the right have no impact at all, but add a stimulus on the left and it degrades it, you use up some capacity. So independent capacities, and we're finding that people have different capacities. So the average adult human can hold four things in working memory simultaneously. We're actually finding it isn't four, it's two and two, but even that's not accurate because people have different capacities. Some people have one and three, some people have five and one, five and two, you know, the, the, it varies highly from person to person. And to answer your question, Moshi, is that we studied um, Chinese citizens who we thought, well, across, there's a lot of variation, but across all people, there's a slight bias towards the left. And we thought, well, maybe that's because we're used to reading left to right, but he studied people who speak, who are native Chinese uh, um, uh, speakers, and they read from top to bottom, and you see the same thing. So it doesn't appear to be anything to do with, it seems to be more a matter of wiring of the brain rather than, uh, than, than exper experience. But it is this curious disconnection between the right and left. And we have this test where you could, we can could actually test you on this. So I have a much higher capacity on my left than I do on my right. And literally for years, I've set up my desk with two, two screens, a screen on the, on the left and a screen in front of me and nothing on the right. And I, I, that just felt more natural to me. I never knew why until we made this discovery. I took my test and I realized I have, a, I have twice as much capacity on the left than I do on the right. So my brain unconsciously has figured out, put all my stuff on the left and don't put anything on the right. Uh, what does it tell about me that I only have one screen at the center? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Errol, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And it's stunning. And keep on, keep on doing it. And I look forward to chatting again. Thank you, Moshi. And thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Thank you all for your attention. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.